The Edge by Roland Smith, part three of chapter two, The Itch. All climbers are gearheads, including me. The storage unit in the basement of our building is stuffed floor to ceiling with my gear and Mom's old gear. I'm not even sure what's in the unit anymore, but I know it's not enough. Ethan knows the best way to get another climber is with the allure of gear. I tried to hide my gear addiction, but it didn't work. Ethan gave me the gear gotcha grin. A gearhead can always pick out another gearhead. Once again, I changed the subject. Who's the climb master? A climb with this many people had to have somebody in charge, probably more than one person. J.R. shook his head. Don't know. They didn't say. But I'm sure it will be someone well known. Plank can get anyone he wants. Which got me thinking about who else was being recruited for the climb. I'm not in the elite climbing circles, but because of my mom and dad, I know a lot of climbers who are. I assume Sunjo is climbing, I said. I wonder if he's climbing for Nepal or Tibet. Neither, J.R. said. He's not on the list. That's weird. We thought so, too. There's a girl climbing for Tibet, 17 years old. I haven't heard of her before. Probably Chinese, Will said. He was probably right. The Chinese think Tibet is China. They wouldn't allow a real Tibetan to climb for peace or any other cause that wasn't in China's political interest. What about Nepal? A boy, J.R. answered. Also 17. Never heard of him either. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they tried to recruit Sunjo, but he must have passed. I heard he's pretty busy since he, since, since his Everest summit. Endorsements, personal appearances, and media interviews, which reminded me why I was happy I wasn't the youngest person to summit Everest. I liked hanging out with the twins. I liked going to the zoo. Sunjo is nearly impossible to reach, Jack said. Everything has to go through Zopa now, and you know Zopa. I don't think anyone really knows Zopa. He's Sunjo's ex-Sherpa. He's also his grandfather and a Buddhist monk who magically appears and disappears when you least expect it. For a second, probably, probably because of the gear, I had drifted towards saying yes to the climb, but now, because of the media attention, I was drifting back to no. I'll think about it, I told J.R., which was a polite way of saying no. There isn't much time to think about it, Ethan said. The climb's next week. A climb for 200 people from all over the world cannot possibly be put together in a week, I said. J.R. shrugged. Plank is famous for getting businesses up and running and lightning speed. Climbing is not a business. That's debatable, Will said. He had a point. A lot of climbers, including my father, were in the business of climbing. What's the big rush, I asked. Maybe Plank's worried that peace will reign on Earth and he'll miss his window of opportunity, Will said. We all laughed. Seriously, though, J.R. said, there is a deadline. Plank wants the Peace Climb documentary to air on Christmas Day. You're kidding me. No joke. He's already bought the airtime. If we don't have the vid in the can by Ho 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 Day, we don't get paid. That was insane. But I guess if you're one of the richest people in the world, insane is not an obstacle. So if I don't climb, who's next on the list? J.R. looked uncomfortable. Yeah, that's the thing, Peek. If you pass, the U.S. won't have a climber in the mix. That's ridiculous. There must be a thousand climbers in the States under 18 who could do the climb. I could give you names of dozens of climbers right now who would jump at the chance. J.R. looked even more comfortable, if that was possible. He glanced at the others as if he was asking for their permission. Ethan, Jack, and Will all gave him a nod. J.R. took a breath and said, We, um, we sort of assured them that you, uh, that you would climb if they hired us to film the climb. I stared at J.R., not quite understanding what he was saying. Are you saying that if I don't climb, you lose the job? That about sums it up. Kind of optimistic, wasn't it? What? J.R. asked, assuring them that I would go on the climb. I guess, J.R. admitted, but there wasn't much choice. I'm not sure they would have come to us if it weren't for our connection to you. A teeniest, a teeniest connection, like being fixed together on a frayed rope. I'm not convinced of that, Jack objected. They saw the Sun Joe video. They were impressed. The Sun Joe video. Would it have been called the peak video if I had succeeded? 
Not that I have any regrets. I chose not to reach the summit for a very important reason. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about Sunjo trudging up those last ten feet, imagining myself following in his heavy footprints to the summit, or, better yet, Sunjo following my footprints to the summit. There are a thousand videographers right here in New York with more climbing creds than we have, J.R. said. They picked us because of peak. It's nice of you it's nice of you guys not to mention the fact that I totally let you down on Everest. You didn't let us down, Will said. You shot the vid of Sunjo reaching the top. We used almost every second of it in the documentary. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't have had anything. I didn't take the video for their documentary. I took it to prove that Sunjo had reached the summit of the highest mountain in the world. I don't understand why Plank's people didn't come directly to me if it was so important that I join their peace climb. That's a great point, J.R. said. We talked about it all the way up here in the cab. And what did you come up with? Zip, J.R. said. It doesn't make sense. Let me ask you this, Ethan said. If Plank's people had asked you directly, what would you have said? I thought about this, but not for long. I probably would have said no. Ethan grinned. Well, there you go. Maybe their approach was shrewder than we think. We've been talking to you for ten minutes, and you haven't said no. Apparently, Ethan didn't understand that all think about it meant no. But then again, maybe it didn't mean no. Not any longer, because now I was thinking about saying yes. If I said no, they'd lose the contract. I wasn't sure that I wanted to let them down again. If I said no, I'd probably never find out why Plank wanted me to climb so badly that he was willing to forego a climber for the U.S. altogether. And then there was the gear. Ethan maintained his grin. What do you say, Peek? Are you in or out? I returned the grin, which I suspected look a lot, looked a lot like Ethan's. In, I said. The crew visibly relaxed. J.R. pulled the folder out of his backpack and gave it to me. We'll leave first thing in the morning. Plank is sending a car for us. We'll swing by and pick you up on the way to the airport. We'll be at your apartment building around 7. Your visa is inside. Visa? Yeah, and don't forget to bring your passport. You can't get into Afghanistan without it. I stared at him, trying to wrap my mind around our climbing destination and recalling the titles in the stack of books my mom, the, the books mom had been carrying. I wasn't certain, but I thought all of them had the word Afghanistan on the spine. I wondered if I would have said yes if I'd known where the climb was taking place. Isn't there a war in Afghanistan? Technically, no, J.R. says. Uh, what about untechnically? Yeah, there is still stuff going on over there. Skirmishes, political unrest, protests, terrorism, I added. J.R. shook his head. I don't think so. Our troops have all pulled out. I think they have an international peacekeeping force there, something like that. But we'll be a long way from where the problems are. And we're doing something positive. The risks are minimal. And Plank has hired a private security force to watch our backs just in case. Mom walked in, still carrying the stack of books. Well, I looked at the spines. I was right about the word. Is it okay if I go to Afghanistan tomorrow? I asked. Sure, she said, then looked at J.R. I just got off the phone with Plank's people. I'm going with you. 